my name is Roger Gatain. I work for Oracle Corporation. Um, my uh, primary responsibilities are I work on a um, specification and implementation called JSF. Perhaps uh, some of you have heard of it, Java Server Faces. I've been working on JSF from just about the beginning. Um, I was actually co-spec lead for JSF 1.2 and 2.0 with my colleague Ed Burns, who I'm sure you you know. Um, Work-related passions, I really like to dabble around in client-side stuff, some JavaScript and real web communication, so I often post some blogs on JSF and how JSF can work um, with things like uh, WebSockets, service end events, and, and stuff like that. Um, hobbies, I like music, I play or hack around with guitar a little bit, I like hockey, my oldest son plays ice hockey. Um, I'm into robotics. Um, I'm a code slinger, probably just like everybody else here. Um, and I like all things cool. Of course, all this takes time. And when you've got a family like I do, you try and do the best you can. So this is just the uh, slide that I'm sure everybody's seen. And uh, you're probably sick of seeing by now. So I'll just jump to the next one. So I'm going to start off by doing a short introduction, um, mainly talk about just a little bit of history that most of you are probably aware of, where the web has been, where it is now, and, and how we got to where it is now. Um, I'll talk about the real-time web a little bit, some of the techniques um, that have been used historically, and some of the techniques that are being used now, especially with HTML5. Um, then I'll get into talking a little bit, get into a little bit more of the JSF aspects and how you can use some of the HTML5 communication techniques with JSF. We'll do a couple of demos along the way. Um, hopefully that one will cooperate with a, a network connection. Um, if it does, it does. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But the first demo I have um, is a little more stable. It doesn't rely on a network connection as much. So, And then I'll wrap things up with a summary. And hopefully we'll have enough time for some Q&A at the end. So just a couple of quotes that I dug up off the web. Web. So when we're talking about real-time stuff, um, you know, Twitter comes to mind, obviously, and there's the canonical application for um, WebSockets, probably, which is chat, which I'm sure everybody has seen and heard. So um, just a couple of quotes from some well-known folks out there uh, about real-time and where we are right now. So traditionally, um, and still is very common, obviously, is the uh, <clears throat> canonical um, HTTP request response protocol. And you know that works great for uh, web apps, but it doesn't really work, obviously, for real-time um, streaming or pushing information from the server. You basically post, a, re uh, post a, a request and get a response back, and there's a full page refresh and, and so forth. So for, for a while back, I mean, folks have been looking to um, increasingly get more dynamic, and they wanted they wanted they wanted the web their web applications to really um, mimic rich clients that are out there. So along came the dynamic web. Um, you know, it's since the 1990s, it has been more dynamic. Many of you probably remember Java applets. Um, that was kind of a weak attempt to try and to try and get there. Iframes, um, which you guys are probably familiar with. Then there's JavaScript and DHTML. And of course, um, Ajax came along. And the interesting thing about Ajax, of course, is that it's been around for years. Um, you know, Microsoft actually had an implementation. Nobody really thought anything about it. Um, 2004, 2005, somebody comes along and coins um, an acronym Ajax, asynchronous Java and XML. And all of a sudden, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. And everybody wants to use it. And you know, it works great. But it's amazing how far an acronym will take you. All right, so traditional patterns. Um, on the far left, <clears throat> on the far left, <clears throat> excuse me, on the far, <clears throat> excuse me, on the far left <clears throat> is uh, polling. Excuse me, I think I need some water.
So there's a traditional polling technique um, that has been used with Ajax, um, mainly because you're trying to simulate, <coughs> excuse me, a server push. <coughs> excuse me, a server push. Um, so what you do, well, the idea behind that is, over a specific time, <coughs> time. <coughs> excuse me, over a specific. Ah, my voice. I don't know what's going on here. So the idea behind polling is that you're, you're submitting requests to the server over specific time intervals to simulate real-time uh, push from the server. And you know this would probably work OK if your server-side updates are not happening frequently, where you don't have to poll over short periods of time. Obviously, that's a performance hit if you find yourself doing that. So, um, you know, in most cases, uh, that may not work out really well. So then there's long polling, where you basically open up, you submit a request, and the request stays open until a response gets received from the server. Once the response uh, gets received from the server, you initiate another request again. That's a little bit better, right? I mean, because you're not, you're not um, uh, initiating requests, a large number of requests from the client. So it's a little bit better performance. And then there's uh, streaming, which opens up some more possibilities, um, where you submit an initial request, and the connection stays open, and then you can constantly receive information from the server. And this is where um, Comet um, actually started. Um, Comet was more or less, I consider it a hack, a uh, first attempt, a hack to, to get um, real-time push uh, from the server we're trying to do it over um, trying to force HTTP, the HTTP request response mechanism to do that. So you ended up with all this hacky code. That was one problem with it. The other problem with it is there was no standardization of it. So you had all these different implementations of it. And then, of course, there's Ajax, um, which, like I said before, you can simulate with uh, real time uh, push through polling. The big thing about AJAX is partial page refresh. And if many of you guys are familiar with JSF, in JSF 2.0, um, we have introduced AJAX into the specification. OK, so let's get into some of the HTML5. <clears throat> the HTML5, excuse me again. Some of the HTML5. Uh, communication techniques that can be used. Now, server-sent events are probably uh, less well-known than, <clears throat> than web sockets. Um, everybody I talk to, I said, have you, have you heard of server-sent events? And they say, no. This has actually been out uh, for, some time as <clears throat> for some time as well. And the idea with uh, server, sent, <clears throat> server sent events is that you can, um, you can basically open up. It's a JavaScript API associated with it, just like a lot of the HTML5 communication <clears throat> techniques. So you can basically open up, oh, <clears throat> open up a connection. Excuse me, I'm sorry. So you can open up a connection um, from the server <clears throat> using the event source uh, JavaScript API. So the advantage of this is that it is a, it's kind of a standard in that it's under the HTML5, <clears throat> HTML5 umbrella. Hmm. And it's, it's the advantage of this is that it's actually over HTTP. So the idea is um, a connection is opened up, and then you basically stream DOM events from the server.
So what you do is when you create the event source object, um, you feed it an event source URL, which is basically an endpoint on the server. OK, so <clears throat> the thing about uh, server sent events <clears throat> is that it's uh, unidirectional. So it's unidirectional. So you basically receive information from, from the server, um, whereas WebSockets is uh, bidirectional. I don't know how much water I can drink. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So um, WebSockets is bidirectional. Um, so essentially, what it is is you know the, this whole this whole conference has been a lot of talk about WebSockets, and it's probably one of the more exciting te <clears throat> technology technologies to use. Um, with HTML5 communication. So the idea behind the idea behind WebSockets is that there's an initial HTTP um, request to establish <clears throat> thanks to establish an initial handshake. All right, thanks. So once that HTTP um, connection is made it, to establish the handshake. The, um, it's upgraded from <clears throat> HTTP to W and to a WebSocket protocol, which is essentially a layer over TCP/IP. So what you, what you have is a real TCP/IP full duplex connection. So I mean, this this is great for <clears throat> for real for real time um, communication. So just like um, you know, there's a JavaScript API for server sent events. There's also one for WebSockets, which some of you might be familiar with. It's pretty simple to use with WebSockets. Most of the work is actually going to be on the server, um, but the JavaScript API is very easy to use from the client. So the idea is basically you open up a connection. There's a function for that. Um, yeah, there's a non-message function where you can register an event listener, event handler in JavaScript. So when you receive information back from the server, you handle that information. Most people update the DOM with information. All right, thanks. There's a non-close function. Um, and so one of the things that people don't talk about very much is you know, what happens if, you know, you've got a WebSocket connection going and the connection drops, for example. You lose the connection. What do you do? I mean, how does your, how does your user interface handle that? Well, the WebSocket um, specification, the way it's supposed to work in theory in certain cases, and I, I haven't dabbled around with it myself, but um, if the connection closes, um, you, 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 you can um, use the onClose um, function from your client and, and do something. Some people try and reopen the connection again automatically. Um, some people maybe just spew out a, a nice error message. But there's various ways you could probably handle that. The other thing I want to mention about WebSockets is um, you know, it's, it's really exciting having an open TCP connection, basically a full duplex connection because you can do so much with it, but it's probably something you want to use sparingly. Um, one of the demos I'm going to show actually opens up two WebSocket connections. You know, with standard uh, request response, there's typically a two connection limit for the browser. With WebSockets, you can go more than that, but you know, obviously you want to use it sparingly. Don't go crazy with it. Think about, think about valid use cases you would want to use WebSockets for. And you know, there's plenty of WebSockets talks here, and I'm sure you guys have been to some of them, and they've probably 
talked about some of that stuff. Okay, so I'm going to get in this portion. I'm going to get into talking a little bit about um, JSF. And how many people know JSF? All right, that's a fair amount of people. Um, so this is not an introductory course on JSF, but um, I am going to be talking about some of the features in JSF 2.0 and how we can use some of that with um, uh, WebSockets in particular. So what I'm calling this the component pattern. So in JSF 2.0, we introduced um, something called composite components, which is an easier way to um, put together components in your user interface. And so um, it, as it turns out, uh, composite components work really, really well with JavaScript. And that you can see where that ties in with some of these HTML5 um, APIs because they're JavaScript. So we can actually encapsulate HTML5 JavaScript API within a JSF component. So a page author who is actually used to, you know, putting JSF tags in their page, it's, it's, it should be seamless to them. So the connection is, is made, the WebSocket is connection when the page loads. And we can also have JSF components which render placeholder markup for receiving message data. So when you get WebSocket information coming back from the server, data from the server, Remember, you have those on message handlers, um, so they're just JavaScript functions. So you can make that work with JSF as well. Um, I've done demos in the past with server sent events um, as well, using the same technique. So this technique I'm going to show you also works with server sent events and WebSocket. There's another pattern I like to call as the modern pattern. So in JSF, you've got um, you know you've got managed beans or beans or any you know, plain old POJO would work. Um, with that, uh, assuming you have a Java API for um, initiating WebSocket requests or whatever, you can do that from a POJO as well. The demos I'm going to show you actually use the, um, um, the new WebSocket JSR stuff that's being developed for Java E7. It's still a work in progress, but it has some really nice annotations you can use. Um, with uh, POJOs and even JSF managed beans, so you can have JSF managed beans as endpoints, WebSocket endpoints. So let's take a chance and look at our first demo here. So what I'm going to do is just start a, um, a WebSocket server here. Um, OK, so this is big, so you guys probably can't see too much of it. But the idea is that you have on the left hand, at the very top, you guys can see a running clock. So that's one, one WebSocket connection I have in this user interface. Um, the second WebSocket connection I have is for this randomly generated flight information coming, getting pushed from the server on the left, lower left-hand side. And then I also have, um, as I receive that data from the server, I'm just using a third-party graphics library, um, graph library, JavaScript library, to just display um, the data graphically. And that's, you can see that changing. Uh, the other part of this demo, let me see if I can, um, this is really big, so let me see if I can change the display a little bit. Just to show you guys. Uh, 
Oh, we're back again. So the other part of this demo, if I scroll down, there's a little area here on the lower left-hand side where I can actually input um, flight information. And this is where the, um, the full duplex by um, bi-directional capabilities of WebSocket. So let's say I want to put in um, flight information here to I put in an existing flight and let's say I want to update gate. So I'm going to update United Airlines flight number 210 Baltimore. And I'm just going to change this to some large number. Press apply. And then you can see the update there. So you know even as you're streaming data you can get that get that going across. Um, the nice thing about this with WebSockets is I'm not going to display the iPad here, but I'm using an iPad here with the same um, with the same UI. If this would work, the idea is basically you can. Um, the idea is you you send with this demo and other real time streaming demos. You make an update like that, it goes, it gets updated on the server, and then with WebSockets you can broadcast that information to multiple clients. So multiple clients will have that updated information real time. Can you do the same thing with Comet? Uh, well, Comet, um, like I mentioned before, Comet is, uh, it's, it's, you can do the same thing with Comet, but it's a lot messier. Um, than web sockets. Okay, let me just get connected here if I can. Right, it says I can't join for some reason, so. Okay, so let's try this again. Okay, so I have, I have this demo running here. You guys are probably not going to see it from back there. I don't want to switch to display because I don't want to use that, lose that. But the same JSF UI is is running on the iPad here. So um, I'm going to see if I can update uh, some flight information here. Uh, let's try Boston one six six one. Let's see if that comes out. There's a connection here still. Oh, that was the wrong. See if that comes out there. Trying to get something that would show up on both. So uh, let's try. Yeah, the information stream by a little bit fast, but the idea is that I can actually put in updated flight information here, and because it's going to the server, it gets updated on the server, and then the information will get broadcast back to all clients that are um, connected via WebSockets. So 
um, the information will get updated here and also on the laptop, which is another client right now. So um, I can't get that working right now, but we'll just move on. So what I want to do is um, show you a little bit of the code that was used to produce this. So the first thing So the, this is the uh, main page of the application. It's um, called flights.xhtml. And it's just a plain old JSF page. Um, the first things that you would want to uh, look at are line number 65 and 66, where um, I've basically created two JSF composite components, WebSocket components. Actually, it's one WebSocket component, but I'm using it twice for two of my WebSocket connections. Um, it has a channel attribute, and the channel attribute actually has um, the WebSocket endpoint that I'm going to be using. In this case, I'm using um, you know, the same WebSocket endpoint, but two connections. And then I have handlers after the colon there. You can see I have a clock handler registered. So I'm specifying the name of a JavaScript function, which is going to be my um, on-message handler for that guy. And that's the handler that actually updates the, um, the user interface for the um, running clock from the server. On the uh, second on line number 66, I have actually two handlers registered. There's a uh, flight handler and a graph handler. <clears throat> the flight handler actually, um, that's the one that updates the, um, the UI with all the flight information. And then the graph handler is another handler that takes that same information and dynamically updates the graph that you saw there. So the WebSocket component itself, um, if you're familiar with composite components, uh, this is really just um, a pretty simple component that has an interface section and an implementation section, as all composite components do. Um, you know, the interface uh, section, you can see where you have a channel. Uh, the implementation section, um, what I've done is I've created a very simple uh, JavaScript um, WebSocket, JSF API. And we're calling the init method, passing in the init function, passing in the channel. And that guy will open up the WebSocket connection. So that's really all there is to the composite component piece. Let's take a little bit of a look at the JavaScript API. Um, you can see where it's basically calling um, the underlying JavaScript um, WebSocket stuff. So the on open method, I'm basically sending an initial <clears throat> register because this is actually using the um, um, the Java E7 WebSocket stuff. The process message function is just a function that is going to, um, when information comes back over the connection, remember I can specify one or more handlers. And those are actually going to be invoked when data comes back over the connection. <clears throat> and here's my, here's my init function. So in the init function, there's where you can actually see the under, underlying WebSocket JavaScript excuse me, API. <coughs> excuse me, I also uh, created a, a get socket function, kind of a, a simple accessor function that could be used depending on where you are in your code. You can get that information, you can get this actual socket handle return so you can use it. So that's all there is to that JavaScript API. I'm going to speed things up a little bit. Um, again, this is a clock composite component. Um, there's nothing really special. It follows the same pattern as I had before. 
Um, this is the JavaScript file um, for the clock handler. I mean, you can actually see um, you get the event data back um, over the WebSocket connection, and it's basically setting um, an element in the DOM. Um, the flight monitor is the one that actually gets the uh, graph, uh, the flight information back. And what this is going to do is it's a, this is basically going to create a table um, where it's actually going to put information in there to um, a placeholder for um, the JavaScript that backs this, which is flight.js. So flight.js is has a send change function. If you recall on the UI, I was able to put in um, flight information and gate information to update it. And that's what that guy does. You can see where I'm using that get socket uh, JavaScript function and sending that off to the server. Um, there's my flight handler, um, which is going to dynamically create the table where you saw the flight information being added. Nothing, if you're familiar with JavaScript, this is really, it's just plain old JavaScript. <clears throat> Nothing really fancy there. Um, again, the graph, the graph one is just a plain old composite component. I'm not going to get too much into, <clears throat> you know, what the JavaScript looks for like that, but that's a, a third party um, uh, JavaScript graph library. You could use something like jQuery if you wanted to, or your favorite uh, graph library that you're used to. OK. All right, so one of the other things um, which is pretty cool with uh, WebSockets is that you can actually um, use it to control physical devices, whether it be um, you know, some sensors in your home, um, you know, turning on off some lights or maybe a robot. Um, you know, so the idea is basically you have your, your client side, your browsers, and you know, you can use the JavaScript API like we did even with JSF and submit, an, uh, submit a, a WebSocket request to a WebSocket server and have that guy um, use a socket connection to um, talk to a robot and maybe tell the robot to turn on some lights or, um, you know, make it move or whatever. So it's, it's pretty cool. Um, but in this particular scenario, you want to have you want to have real-time updates as possible. So, you know, imagine, imagine you, you're over the connection and you, you want to control some sensors, but at the same time, it's great that you can control some sensors, but you want some feedback back on the UI saying what's the status of those sensors? Are they on, are they off still, or, or what's going on? So you can see where the bi-directional communication capabilities of WebSockets come in for that. So, See if I can do a demo here. Um, looks like there's some problems already, but we'll see. So I, I don't know if this is going to work. Um, we'll see if the network uh, folks are with me. You know, maybe this will work. But so the idea, yeah, there we go. So the idea is this is a um, this is again a JSF user interface. I've got a little robot over there with a couple of LEDs on there. The robot has a um, a Wi-Fi shield, what's called a Wi-Fi shield on there. Um, you can also get them with Bluetooth, but I, for whatever reason I chose Wi-Fi. It's got a little uh, C sketch on there, so I did a little bit of C programming. I had to open up my old C books. It's been a while since I programmed in C. Um, 
So the idea is I have a JSF UI here showing the patterns that I showed you guys before. Nothing, nothing really out of the ordinary. There's one WebSocket connection here. It's opening up a WebSocket connection and I can shut this guy off. I can have controls here to make it pulse. Um, Oh, you can actually, um, but the screen is actually big. There is, uh, let me uh, scroll down a little bit, because I do have a little status table here, which uh, shows the what's happening as information is coming back. So if I uh, put this guy on, the red light's on, and then I also get an indication coming back saying it's on, the signal's on. Um, if I turn it off, same thing. If I want to do a 100 millisecond, pul uh, 100 millisecond pul pulse race, uh, rate, um, same thing. I can control it. Information comes back. The UI gets updated. I can change the pulse, pulse rate again. Uh, and so forth. Simple on and off. But, but you get the idea. So, um, you know, WebSockets is great for stuff like this as well. Um, we want to utilize that bi directional communication, um, especially controlling devices, and at the same time, getting a real time status back saying, hey, did it, did it, you know, is the, is the uh, device actually on or off or whatever to get immediate feedback. So, kind of glad that worked. Um, let me go back to uh, the presentation. Well, actually, before I go back to the presentation, I can show you some of this code. Hopefully, we're not running out of time, but we might be. Um, I'm not going to go over and show you guys all the composite component stuff that went into this UI because it's the same pattern that was used in the first demo. So what I'd like to do is show you um, what the actual bean looks like. Um, so this is, this is what I call the light bean. So this, um, this is the first entry point for a WebSocket request. So this happens to be a JSF managed bean, which is also an endpoint. And this, how many people have looked at the WebSocket JSR stuff? You looked at it, so you're familiar with some of these annotations. So the nice thing about this is that it provides um, some really nice annotations. You can see the at WebSocket annotation on uh, line 53. Um, you can open up, um, you can specify a WebSocket endpoint, in this case, slash LED. Um, there's also a remote attribute there, which is used to, it's another class, which is helpful for broadcasting information back. There's a WebSocket context, which is useful. There's a WebSocket message annotation that I'm using, um, and that basically annotates a Java method in your bean, and that's the one that's going to receive information back from the, the WebSocket server. So imagine, you know, that, imagine that, um, you know, this is actually going to, actually, this is going to, this is actually going to process the message coming in, and then what you're going to do is you can see on line number. Uh, 70 and beyond, we're broadcasting that information back. So all, kind of, all interested clients that are connected over this connection will get information back via this broadcast method, which is really nice. So you can see this is a really nice API with annotations that you can annotate any POJO and have this work over a WebSocket web socket connection. So that's that guy. Um, So what I'd like to show then, so the other piece to this demo, okay, so remember that initial diagram I showed? <clears throat> I showed, um, I showed information coming from the client <clears throat> to the web, <clears throat> excuse me, to the web, web socket server. In the, in the case of this robotics demo, 
um, I need something when I, when I receive a request, I need to be able to talk to this robot device. So this uh, robot device, like I mentioned before, has a little bit of C code on there, which opens up a socket. So this Java class that I wrote is really nothing special. It just uses the Java.NET socket API to actually communicate with that. And then that guy sends information back to here, and this guy forwards it back, so it eventually ends back at, at the UI. So you can do tricks like that. The nice thing about the, the Wi-Fi shield that I'm using on here, too, is that um, you can actually have a tiny web server running on here, so you can, you can um, post HTTP requests to that guy and, and have that guy send re uh, replies back or whatever, request response. But since I wanted to use WebSockets for this demo, that's why I was using the, um, the Socket API. No, it doesn't replace it. Ajax is not going away. Comet, yes, I would say. Um, you could still use Comet. You can use anything you want that you're comfortable with. Um, but I'm a little confused how they fit together. Right. Well, in the beginning of the talk, I mentioned that Ajax um, follows the traditional, and well, it is basically HTTP. Um, it follows the request response protocol. But the idea behind that is that you can use Ajax to get information back from the server and do a partial page update. So in traditional request response um, uh, web applications, there's always a full page refresh going on. With Ajax, you can update um, a single DOM element if you want. So it gives the appearance of a rich client user interface. So there's nothing preventing you, and I don't have a demo here, but you can certainly use Ajax along with WebSockets and your UI. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. Excuse me? Yes, I'll get into that in a little bit. So here's just a little overview of the, um, the demo that we just looked at. On the browser client, we have the JavaScript API. On the WebSocket server implementation, I have um, there's a simple Java bean. Um, could be a JSF managed bean, and that uses a socket handler to actually communicate to the SDK that's on the actual device. Gets the information back, and it gets back to the client. So it's really, it's just all socket stuff with WebSocket. So these are a couple of uh, resources um, that I find useful. Um, you can go to and find out what. Um, HTML, HTML5 technologies are available in which browsers. This is kind of what it looks like. So this is an example. This is uh, for server sent DOM events. It will tell you, and I, I think this stuff is pretty update, uh, pretty updated and fairly recent. But you know, it'll tell you where the where they're supporting and which browsers, which versions, and so forth. Same thing with WebSockets. So. Um, as of a couple of versions ago, WebSockets is available in Firefox. Actually, I was using Firefox for the demo, which is nice. For the longest time, it wasn't available in WebSockets, and there's nothing wrong with Chrome. Um, Chrome has probably been one of the pioneer browsers uh, for WebSocket support. Um, but that just gives you an idea of what's available. So a little summary, we talked about, we talked about traditional web and dynamic web, uh, kind of like where we've been historically and how we ended up where we are and why. I went over some patterns and technologies, Ajax, Comet. Um, then I went into a little bit about um, some of the HTML5 communication techniques, uh, server sent events and web sockets. Talked a little bit how you can use this stuff uh, specific to JSF. Um, and then we went over a couple of use cases and showed you guys some device um, manipulation using web sockets as one use case. Some references, uh, the top one, uh, third, the thirdstone.com. That's a site I put together. It's, it's kind of new. There's not a whole lot of information out there. <clears throat> I will be putting more stuff out there. Uh, the second link is a link to the, um, the WebSockets specification that's going to go into Java E7. 
and now a corresponding JC, <coughs> excuse me, JCP site. And questions? Yeah. So, from my understanding, the browser has a limited number of ports. Yeah, but with typical, even with AJAX and typical HTTP and stuff, there's like a two connection limit, something like that. Right, I think the IE, no, three, I think Yeah, I haven't been up to date with that, so but. How does that work out? I mean, if the, you have two web socket connections on the, on the first demo, right. does that only leave one room, or does it, like, am I, is there only two ports? I haven't tried that, but uh, <clears throat> I know if you have, if you try and do three AJAX or whatever, you know, some of the, or whatever that traditional HTTP, that's, that won't work out. Um, I just know with web sockets you can have more um, available, but like I said, you want to use that sparingly. And, and on the server side, though, this, uh, so we have obviously so many um, users, and then they all have their browsers open <coughs> on the server side. So many right. connections now open. So does that hurt the performance? And then how? Well, like I said before in the beginning of the talk, with web sockets, it's a lot of the work complicated work, thread management, all that stuff, request management, is really on the server. And thankfully there's, you know, there's quite a few server implementations out there. Um, you know, from the client, you have to really manage stuff you know, in terms of um, if, what happens if a connection drops and so forth. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Sorry about the voice. <laughs>